Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are on this, uh, I guess, lovely spring day. Uh, I, my name is Matt Ackley. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Ritchie Brothers. And uh, we are here today with another one of our Inside Edge live industry panels. Today, we're going to focus on the agriculture business, actually the state of agriculture in Canada. We have an amazing panel today, lots of great information. And, you know, what we're trying to do here is, look, we've been in the business for a long time. We love the gatherings. We love the gatherings at the sales. It gives us an opportunity to see each other and exchange information. Well, you know, during this COVID period, in absence of all of that, it, we're experimenting with new ways to, you know, get together digitally and, and still share the same type of information. And as such, we've assembled a panel today. We're going to walk through uh, some questions we got ahead of time. Uh, and then there's also the opportunity to ask questions in real time. So just please use the Q&A function uh, on the meeting invite. Uh, and, you know, with that said, we'll get started. The first thing I want to do is uh, introduce you to the panel. I'm going to have them uh, introduce themselves. And uh, Craig, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for having me. My name is Craig Clemmer. I'm Principal Agriculture Economist at Farm Credit Canada. I've uh, been with the company about... Uh, 12, 13 years, and our, our role is really understanding that risk and what we're seeing in the operating environment, trying to make sense of what it means for, for you guys, the industry, Canadian agriculture. So um, yeah, thank you very much for having me on today's panel. Perfect, John. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm John Schmeiser. I'm the CEO of the Western Equipment Dealers Association. Uh, this is a role that I've held uh, since 1996 and did grow up at, um, as a son and a grandson of a farm equipment dealer. Our association, um, uh, our operations revolve on three pillars, advocate, educate and elevate. Uh, advocate is uh, lobbying to manufacturers and, and government entities. Educate is training that we provide to our equipment dealers and elevate is programs and service that, that help our dealers uh, in their operations. We're an international organization, 750 members, uh, in nine Canadian provinces, as well as an additional 1,500 members in 10 U.S. states, headquartered in Kansas City, but a Canadian office uh, in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, Matt, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel and to uh, share some insights uh, from our organization about the state of the industry. Great, thanks. Now on to a couple of RB folks. Kevin? Uh, Kevin, you're muted. Oh, well, I had that. Sorry about that. Uh, my name's Kevin Tink, uh, obviously not very computer literate. Uh, my role has been uh, as an auctioneer and senior advisor for the company for quite some time now. I participated at an executive level leading Canada for the first 10 years of my career with uh, Richie Brothers, going on 20 now and uh, 30 years in this business about half of it predominantly focused on agriculture and about half of it fo focused on the industrial world. So uh, been an interesting journey for me and uh, thanks for having me as part of the panel. Awesome. And Jordan? Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us, Matt. Uh, my name is Jordan Clark. I'm a sales director for our Canada Prairies Division. So. Um, I started with a company in 2007. We came through uh, to Ritchie Brothers through an acquisition of our family-owned auction company. So I've, I've grew up in the business and I've grew up in the prairies. I uh, live just south of Regina in a small farming community. Um, and throughout the years with Ritchie Brothers, I've progressed from uh, a, a salesperson out in the field right up to the role I'm in right now. So uh, proud to lead our Canada Prairies group, which is uh, uh, consists of four agricultural business units and then our industrial uh, business unit from Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So we cover everything Canada Prairies, uh, lots of egg and a little bit of industrial and um, happy to be here and happy to talk about agriculture. Awesome, awesome. And uh, yeah, the thing I love about this panel is we've got, you know, great mix of, you know, across the industry, folks from RB, folks from outside of RB and, you know, you know, I, this is always kind of a, 
you know, an interesting special place when when RB acquired Iron Planet. I came from the Iron Planet side of the business. One of the first trips I made was 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 up to Saskatoon. Um, so uh, it's great to finally do a panel here. So before we dive into the questions, you know, here's just you know here's just some of the topics we're going to talk about today. These are these are some of the things that came in uh, ahead of time when we surveyed a bunch of different folks. Uh, so once again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in as we go along, and and I'll either try to work them in or or, or save them uh, for later. So with that, let's jump right in. And you know, Craig, why don't you why don't you take us over what's going you know what's going on with uh, agriculture in Canada today? Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, when I talk about think about the agriculture industry and where we are and what to expect over the twelve months. Um, you know, I, I think there's three things that we need to really concentrate on. It's going to impact um, the, the agriculture industry and specifically when we think about uh, what we see in Western Canada. And I guess I'd put those into, you know, what's going on in interest rates, obviously what's happening in the Canadian dollar that impacts our competitiveness. And then finally, um, you know, as we're kind of showing with the graph here, what do we expect in overall farm revenues or farm cash receipts? So maybe just start here with interest rates because it kind of sets up what we're seeing in the marketplace. But, um, you know, just recently the Bank of Canada just out, out um, adjusted their their uh, expectation of the Canadian economy. Uh, things are recovering a little bit more quickly as we start to slowly see some some signs of, you know, positive signs of the reopening of the Canadian economy. And, and as a result, we're expecting rates to start increasing in 2022. Um, that's a little bit earlier than what they originally said. They're looking at rates not starting to increase till about 2023. So, you know, that's an improvement in terms of where we're seeing things going on. Uh, so what does this mean and why do we care about this? Well, if the rates start increasing from the Bank of Canada, it's going to put some upward pressure on, on interest rates, especially variable rate products. Um, but we we'll also need to look at what's happening elsewhere from in the interest rate perspective. The U.S. economy, uh, U.S. Federal Reserve, they just recently announced that they're holding uh, kind of steady on on rates there and, and not really changing their commitments for, for moving forward there. Um, and when we look at bond purchasing programs from central banks, they remain fairly robust, although they recently pulled back in Canada. All this to say, what we do see is that interest rates are starting to, to show signs of, uh, of upward pressure there. Um, what we do see is uh, interest rates or um, rates in the Canada look to be a little bit more bullish than what we see in the United States at this point in time. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty with the recovery there. So, you know, we're starting to see some upward pressure on longer term rates at this moment. Uh, currently, variable rate products, short term stuff seems really quite affordable and cheap. Um, not a whole bunch of extra pressure right now, but we're starting to see, you know, more more opportunities in the recovery and that could see rates moving up a little bit quicker than what we originally thought. The second side of the story, the second thing I'd be monitoring is the Canadian dollar. Obviously, when it comes to farm equipment, uh, you know, we're very dependent on trade with the United States, whether it's cost of inputs or just the, the manufacturing of equipment being uh, happening quite a bit in the United States. Uh, and just the movement back and forth. Also on the competitiveness of our products and the exports that we're doing for our output need to be monitoring what's happening in the Canadian dollar. So from that perspective, there's a few things. One, if we look back at that interest rate conversation, um, you know, one major driver of the value of the Canadian dollar is just that, that interest rate spread between the US Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada and that expectation of improvements or inflationary pressures between the two economies there. So at this point, you know, just recently we're seeing Canada a little bit more bullish on the recovery uh, or more bullish on terms of rate movements than we did in the United States recently. So that's being supportive of the Canadian dollar. In addition to that, we're starting to see some upward pressure on commodities, uh, notably oil looking to be you know, slightly more optimistic and that's increasing demand for the Canadian uh, Canadian oil and, and, and thus uh, demand for Canadian dollar. So you know, what we're looking at is a fairly strong Canadian dollar based on historical perspectives. We're now kind of hovering over this 80 cent mark. And we see that that, hap that should be happening through most of 2021 before, you know, I suspect we're going to see some of that pull back later on in 2021 as the U.S. economy starts taking its heels and, and growing. And that's going to make uh, Canadian exports a little bit more competitive, but it will make purchases or imports of, of farm equipment from the United States a little bit more expensive. So uh, a bit of a mixed story there, depending on which side of the coin you're sitting on. 
And then finally, what I think we need to monitor is what's happening on farm revenues. So if we look here at the slide um, over the last little bit, farm revenues have been increasing quite, quite a bit. But before we look at this whole story, I think we need to think about where we were at the beginning of 2019. You know, just remember we had some harvest troubles at the end of 2018. Prices were pretty lackluster and not a lot of excitement and things going into 2020 uh, or sorry, 2019. Um, and then when we think about 2020, on top of all these challenges, we had this global pandemic. So, um, you know, there's some concerns about the grain and oil seed sector uh, in 2019 and the early part of 2020. And, and that was a bit of a change. You know, despite all these concerns, we did see demand recover quite strong, uh, probably more robust than what we originally thought. Um, you know, in addition to seeing strong demand in domestically and international markets, uh, less movements of commodities and, and goods in Canada freed up some rail capacity and we're able to move quite a bit of that inventory. So overall, things really popped pretty strong in 2020 for the, the market and farm cash receipts ended up growing about 8% of glow, you know, overall all commodities. Uh, if we look at where we're going to go for 2021, we're forecasting that uh, receipts are going to increase about another 7% this year, uh, just building on that strength that we've seen continued movements of grains and oil seed, especially out of Western Canada, uh, and starting to see some recovery and some stability in other parts of the livestock sector uh, moving moving forward. So, you know, I think we're starting to take a picture of, of some more optimism and looking forward there. Just kind of diving down, if you think about the audience here and really focusing what's happening on the grains and oilseed side of things, kind of want to focus on two numbers on this slide. If you look at the bottom number, uh, total average there, when we look at grains and oilseed farm cash receipts this year, they increased 18%. Uh, that's a big jump than what we would see and that just really speaks to those opportunities. So, you know, as I mentioned, I don't want to really highlight it, but if we think about where we were in that those challenges, market access concerns, uh, you know, moving pulses into India, some challenges or concern about canola movement, things weren't looking great at the beginning of 2020, uh, but with that strong demand, we actually saw receipts increasing 18%. If we look at where we are right now and kind of looking into 2021, we're seeing continue, um, continue opportunities there. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty still remains for 2021. I know with dry weather and that's always on people's mind here, but through the first eight months of the year, we're seeing very strong prices and the inventory continues to be moving from that 2020 crop. And, and those are looking to be very supportive. So we're looking at, you know, overall cash receipts to increase maybe 20%. That might be a bit on the optim optimistic side, just depending on how much of that inventory moved over the last, um, you know, in 2020 versus 2021, but still really strong growth overall in farm cash receipts here. And, and that's going to create some, you know, good opportunities for selling into this, uh, into this market. And, and I think that's uh, going to keep building on some of that optimism that we see in the industry and supportive of equipment demand, both new and used in 2021. Um, I just kind of want to take a pause here and just kind of where we were versus where we're going, because I think this is really important when we think of the farm equipment market. So this number here, this is the December uh, 31st numbers comparing uh, total unit sales or orders of new equipment from manufacturers uh, at, at December 31st. And a couple points that I really think is worthwhile highlighting and, and kind of speaking to how the markets evolve, but self-propelled combine purchases or orders there we're down 30%, um, you know, year over year. Um, if we think about, oh, sorry, year to date, they're down 14%. If we look at four wheel drive tractor sales total uh, or orders, they were down 6% almost. We look at 100 plus horsepower tractors down 10%. And really that marketplace where we saw the number of units that were brought into Canada, those new units that were brought into Canada, whether that's building up inventories or new orders, were down quite a bit. And really reflecting all those uncertainties that we saw um, in, in 2019 and kind of coming into 2020 and, and those concerns that the overall industry had. And that just kind of sets us up into what this means for inventories where we are and, and some of the, explain some of the storyline in terms of the availability of equipment and some of the challenges. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit long, uh, further on here in the, in the questions, but just want to set that context. And then finally, you know, don't want to forget about it. Obviously, 
The livestock sector is also extremely important to Western Canada. We are starting to see some recovery in the hog markets. Uh, uncertainty about the, the recovery in the Chinese hog herd is putting some upward pressure. We did see some uh, African swine fever in, in Germany. That's another major exporting country. Um, so those are creating some space for Canada and the United States exports into the market. Uh, and just the recovery overall in Canada and the United States is increasing um, uh, prices and, and we're seeing some opportunities for hogs. On the cattle side of things, more important, obviously, to Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Western Canada, uh, we are seeing fairly neutral um, shift in uh, farm cash receipts expected in 2021. Prices aren't recovering quite as much as what we would like to see, and, and a bit more of a muted story. On top of that, we're dealing with some very high feed costs, so we're going to probably continue to see some margin uh, pressures there. In the, in the cattle industry. And this could obviously have some impact overall on demand for farm equipment here in 2021 uh, and the latter half of the year here. So, um, you know, overall, I think the industry is kind of moving into a pretty good spot. We're seeing some optimism, especially on the grains and oil seeds. Uh, we're seeing, you know, good receipts, good forecasts for receipts. Uh, and those are gonna uh, fuel some good purchases and, and some decisions there. Obviously, some uncertainty when it comes to some components of it, weather and, and things to, that can come into play. Uh, but, you know, I think we're setting up for a pretty strong demand, year of demand for farm equipment at this point, uh, uh, based on what we're seeing in the fundamentals. The dollar is, is a bit of a challenge for imports, uh, but we are getting some pretty good returns on the exports, um, you know, at, at a pretty balanced spot right now. So when we look at this, um, you know, if we look at this pandemic impact, you know, we're seeing a number of challenges happening here. Um, you know, supply chain disruptions and things are going on in the manufacturing. I believe this is somebody else's slide that we're going to take over on this one. Yeah, sure. John, do you want to pick up here? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Craig. I'll I'll take it from here. And and one of our priorities as an equipment dealers association is to work closely with our industry partners on issues of uh, mutual concern. And, and you know that's producer groups and and manufacturers as well. And and when the pandemic hit, we immediately thought the worst. But in the end, um, the past year really exceeded ex expectations from equipment sales point of view. And I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but very important to our members, we were able to secure essential services designation for our equipment dealers right across North America. Uh, this was critical for us um, as we needed this to be able to stay open. But perhaps the biggest impact that we did see was the supply chain. Uh, it was affected at the start and, and continues to be negatively affected today. So in our conversations with manufacturers, we know that a lot of the components for farm equipment are manufactured in plants in northern Mexico. And even with the land border closure, there is very little difficulty for us in getting a completed tractor or combine across the U.S.-Mexico or the U.S.-Canada border. However, when it came to trying to get a part or a harness or an electrical component, we were facing a lot of unusual delays because of COVID-19. So the wait, dealer, the wait times for dealers on parts tripled in some cases, and still today manufacturers have cut back production um, just solely because of availability issues on components. Uh, for Canadian-based manufacturers, the issues were exactly the same. Uh, delivery dates have been pushed back 10 to 12 months. All these issues have created the demand for used equipment. And, you know, fortunately for our equipment dealers, a, a lot of them had their used inventory cleaned out. However, in conversations with manufacturers, we feel that the worst is behind us and efficiencies in the supply chain have improved. So when we look back over the past year, I, I think this quote from an Alberta dealer says it's best. We perhaps are one of the few industries that have come out better in 2020 than when we started. We realize people have to eat, which means farmers will farm. And when farmers will farm, they need us for support. And we do our best to be there for them. So as you can understand, coming out of a very successful 2020, there was a lot of optimism at the start of this year. And that continues four months in. There are three key indicators that we track that drive equipment sales, commodity prices, cooperative weather and interest rates. And all of those have been in alignment for us. And that's created a pent up demand for a new equipment and the new technology. But really the question remains, will the manufacturers be able to deliver 
all the equipment that dealers have ordered or dealers have predicted that they will be able to sell. So when we look at our early orders, this is one metric that we do track. And the early order period usually takes place between September and December. And all manufacturers reported a strong pre-sell period in late 2020. We have close to 60% of our dealers reporting that they have ordered more equipment for 2021, with 21% of dealers increasing orders by more than 10%. These numbers are the highest that we have seen in the past five years, and you know very much so another healthy indicator of the industry. So let's have a look at the March sales numbers. This is year to date, and we're seeing substantial double digit percentage growth in all categories. So Craig gave you the end of December numbers. This is where we are at the end of March. These numbers are unprecedented and surpass the largest numbers that we've ever had in percentage growth going back to 2007, 2008. Now keep in mind that the 2020 numbers were before the pandemic hit. So it adds another element. The, these year, year, year over year growth numbers are phenomenal. And again, based on our dealer reports, we're forecasting that these numbers will continue to be strong for the remainder of the year. Another metric we track is used combine pricing. And for the first time in nine years, we have used combines gaining value or seeing increased pricing based on the longer that they're sitting on a dealer's lot. And I'm sure that's, that's not news that our customers like to hear, but I think it really speaks to the demand for used equipment that is out there in the marketplace. At the start of each crop year, we ask our dealers, you know, what are their best bets for sales for the coming year? What demand do they see coming? And they, they typically provide this data uh, to us based on the quotes or the type of deals that they're working on with their producer customers. And all of these are, are big agricultural items. And when you have 80% and above of equipment dealers stating four wheel drive tractors, combines, air drills, having increased sales this year, this again points to another positive factor uh, on the market. So with that, I'll turn it over to colleagues at Ritchie Brothers. Fantastic, thanks, John. Um, yeah, so we're just talking again a, a bit about the demand of, of equipment in Western Canada from an auction perspective. Um, the last three months, you know, probably gives us the best perspective of um, sales that we, we will have throughout the entire year, just based on the, the pure amount of um, farm auctions that we have, combined with the, the assets we sell from our permanent yard sites from an agricultural standpoint. So we have a lot of data points to reference, uh, which is very, very interesting to look at, but uh, also a lot of those those data points come from farm auctions. So it, it provides a really well-rounded uh, look at what an operation would sell for year over year or what um, a pricing might be compared to for sale over sale. So uh, the one the one general point that we wanted to touch on was that overall, we've seen a nice bump in our agricultural pricing uh, for the last three months with a 7% increase uh, versus this time last year. So uh, just kind of what, uh, what um, John and Craig had touched on, is that there's a general trend of things being more positive than they were uh, a year ago at this time. And even though throughout uh, 2020, we, see, we saw a very strong pricing in most categories of agricultural equipment, uh, the past three months have shown uh, an increase that much more. So one of the guys that touched on uh, tractors uh, being a, a, of high demand. And from our standpoint, uh, we sell a lot of tractors, especially at this time of the year. Uh, I think the tractor category is a little bit unique because it does cover uh, lots of different sizes and ranges um, and, and makes and models, but of course the tractor is very popular in most farms. There's usually multiple units. It's a it's a piece of equipment that can be used on, on multiple seasons and for different applications, as opposed to say a combine or a header or or a sprayer itself. So uh, just in that regard, with with high horsepower tractors from uh, a track tractor standpoint or a four wheel drive standpoint, we sold almost 21.3 million dollars of tractors over the last uh, three months in Western Canada. Um, and we've seen a lot of our, our quantities go up and, and tractor category is no different. Um, when you look at front wheel assist tractors and, and of course the high horsepower tractors, a lot of the quantities have gone up and there's a lot of, lot of dollar value there. Um, but the actual medium price has, has dropped a bit and I think this actually leads a little bit into um, the supply and demand um, uh, aspect and I'll let maybe let Kevin touch on, touch on that in a second. But 
Um, I think it really shows that throughout the last three months, we've sold a lot of pieces of equipment and a lot of tractors in particular. Um, but we haven't had a lot of, of dealership equipment at our sales. Um, and we were really lacking a couple of those, those really large farm dispersals that we, we seem to get year over year. We had a lot of a lot of auctions and a lot of really good auctions for sure, um, but the the average price of the sales uh, was a little bit down. But we just had more more auctions, so I think that uh, gave us just a little bit of an insight that um, that we had a lot of affordable equipment, but just not a lot of that real high end uh, equipment, especially in the tractor category. Yeah, I'd certainly I think concur with that, uh, Jordan. I mean, the categories per se, uh, with the limited availability from the dealers that we would normally see. Uh, this sampling probably provides a, a bit more of a aged or dated inventory with a few more hours on it, and yet uh, realizing far beyond what we would have realized in the year or two or three previously, and probably no see this as a situation where some of these gentlemen, as things normalize, may have felt that they've got a very expensive uh, used combine to try and work their way through or tractor should that be the case. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see, you know, what, you know, all these, you know, external impacts are having on, you know, the price of equipment, you know, whether obviously it be the state of the market, whether it be <clears throat> commodity prices, whether it be, you know, component prices and shipping concerns and so forth is, you know, we're seeing this all around in in some of these, uh, in many of these, these industries. And I know Jordan and Kevin, you know, we've had to undergo a big change uh, as a result of COVID. And uh, you know, I know it's been a long tradition of Ritchie Brothers, how we conduct these farm auctions, and that's changed substantially. Uh, over the past year, year and a quarter or so. And, you know, why don't you kind of walk everybody through what, what's happening there? Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I really think, you know, obviously the, the COVID pandemic uh, forced our hand and, and forced our hand to change. And we had a responsibility for uh, for all our, our customers that we had farm auctions signed for in March of 2020 to, to try and figure out how to conduct their auction sale, uh, do it safely, do it effectively, but also just you know fulfill our, our obligation to them. So I'm really happy with the transition that we all made in a very short amount of time, but I'm also really happy that um, the company had the tools that we were able to tap into and, and use it to make that transition very seamless for our sellers, but also for our buyers and, and for our staff. There's a, there a large adjustment period for everybody, uh, and I'm really happy with the way that uh, everyone's able to make the adjustment. Now, you know, since that point to today, we've sold well over 200 uh, different farm auctions uh, and, and offsite events by the timed auction format. And I think selfishly, I could talk about the way it's it's benefited our company. Um, but I think for what I do want to focus in on is, is our sellers and our buyers. So from a, a seller's perspective on, on sale day in the past uh, was a very chaotic day. Uh, there was a lot of pressure and of course, a lot of emotions, which we can all expect. But uh, typically on sale day, you would have saw, you know, 200 to 1,000 people on site. Uh, it was very weather dependent, obviously, the success of, of having a crowd there, uh, having that atmosphere there, um, you know, played a, a large part in that. And of course, working with or against the weather was was um, a factor, as well as on sale day, the, the amount of people that want to talk to the owner, the questions, the concerns, a lot of that was held until sale day. So uh, our sellers were very busy on sale day trying to start equipment, answer questions, uh, and they actually didn't get a chance to really step back and, and enjoy what, what should be, you know, relatively uh, enjoyable day. It's a it's a transfer of, of um, you know, from active farmer to retirement. So, you know, it's there's lots of motions involved, but typically it's one that that was uh, brought on by themselves and they're happy to, you know, have that day pass. Now, fast forward to, to what it looks like uh, with a timed auction is on sale day, there's there's a lot of times there's there's no visitors. There's There might be a handful or a couple dozen that come to do last minute, uh, you know, previews of the equipment, but our sellers really do get a chance to just sit down and enjoy and, and watch their items actually transact, where typically, you know that that wasn't wasn't the case, um, and so we've we've seen you know shops full of uh, friends and family. We've seen you know a, a couple that sat on a deck and watched their sale on a on a laptop and had a drink and and just enjoyed the day. So we we see a lot of a lot of people that just enjoy having that time to themselves and and the privacy to do that. And of course, it's a it's a turning of the page or a chapter closing. Um, so from a seller's perspective, I think it's much more um, uh, enjoyable and maybe you know not as chaotic and hectic. Um, how, however, from a buyer's perspective as well, I think it's 
um, you know, weather was was always a factor of whether I can get to the sale. And of course, trying to be there, um, you know, some customers are able to balance, you know, looking at another sale on their phone or on the app, um, but typically their their attention is on that sale that they're, they attended. So, so now we found that a lot of people are able to attend multiple sales in one day and the, the bidding process is, is obviously the, the, the time has opened up prior to the sale for bids. So anywhere from 75 to 85% on an agricultural sale, the, the bids are, are there prior to sale to even happening. Um, so a lot of the bidding is, is happening prior to the sale. And of course, from a seller's or buyer's perspective, sorry, they have the chance to do that and, and they, they feel more productive. They can still do what they, they need to do at their own farm or their own operation, but still be present at, at multiple sales and participate in the sales too. So um, the ability to you know have technology, obviously reach out to them when they've been outbid, uh, they can set max bids uh, and priority bids. So there's there's lots of ways to still participate at the auction sale without physically being on site. So there there is definitely some uh, some benefits uh, that way for the buyers. Uh, however, you know we we still obviously sell by uh, by live auctioneer as well. And of course, both Kevin and I come from uh, you know long uh, history of of auction companies that uh, sold by live auction. And of course, there's still going to be a place for that. Um, you know the 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 timed auction process and the computer. You know it has a tough time describing really what the operation, the legacy, the history, the quality of the operation, uh, where obviously when you have someone that can speak to that and speak to the buyers uh, and really resonate that that um, that operation and history to the, the, the buying public uh, is, is truly important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jordan. I mean, the, the benefits of, in many of those events of, of the live auction year, uh, does transcend into uh, buyer comfort and of course if uh, if a person is going to make a significant purchase the more comfortable they are it's our belief that the greater they'll participate so certainly has its uh, its place in the program albeit sometimes it's, it's not as convenient uh, we do know that it's been very advantageous on certain types of lots from timing and uh, you know, fortunately enough, we're, we're in a position where we have a blended uh, solution that we can apply to many different scenarios to do our job, which of course is to maximize results for the sellers. Yeah, and I think that's a, Kevin, that's a, that's a perfect point. You know, we've kind of managed to, you know, blend, you know, uh, you know, almost, you know, create this hybrid model of the best of both worlds, which has been, you know, really fascinating during the, the COVID period. Um, you know, but as we as we talk about, you know, the, this advance of of technology, you know, there's another area, right, where, you know, we're seeing this in particular, even, you know, me, somebody who's come, you know, from outside the industry, I, I've read about this issue even before joining the industry, you know, and that's the whole, you know, right to modify repair. And so, you know, I think, John, if you want to take us through some of the, um, you know, the the issues related to that, I know that's very much, you know, on the top of a lot of people's minds in the in the agricultural space. Yeah, it sure is, Matt. Um, you know, and, and thank you again. And, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of producers may have seen that there's some momentum in the United States on bills that would implement right to repair uh, in 2021. Over 40 states uh, have introduced uh, bills that address the right to repair and, and almost all 40 of them have agricultural and construction equipment uh, as, as kind of a, um, uh, an, uh, an application part where the bill would apply to um, uh, equipment of that type. But it's important to note that no right to repair bills affecting agricultural equipment have been passed to the state and we don't anticipate any to pass uh, in the near future. And uh, we've, we've as, as an association have, have been tried to be providing information on, on this topic. So you may have seen a series of op-eds that we've done in the Western Producer, the Manitoba Cooperator, and the Alberta Farmer on the issue. Uh, we've also met with producer groups on the issue, uh, including CFA, CAP, APAS, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission to discuss kind of like a, another side to the issue and um, why we have opposed right to repair bills and quite frankly, you know, going into the weeds a little bit about why they're not passing uh, in the United States. And what we've seen from the right to repair efforts in the U.S. is that the intent is to get legislation to modify farm equipment rather than right to repair. So we, we think it's mislabeled intentionally because who's against a right to repair? And 
But when you get down into the weeds of the legislation and lanes of legislation, you know, that's why these these right to repair bills are failing, because in the language, the right to repair advocates, they want the ability to change source code on the onboard computers and illegally modify equipment to get around safety and emission standards. So farmers have the right to repair their own their own equipment. It has never been taken away and nor is a law required to reinforce uh, the farmer's right to repair their, their own equipment. But make no mistake, our, our equipment dealer members completely understand that the frustration that a, that a customer has when there's downtown downtime on, on a unit and they can't get an answer for an error code. So as an association and as an industry, we feel an industry solution is much better than a regulated or a legislated one. And that's where the industry has stepped up. And I will admit that the industry, including equipment dealers and manufacturers, have done a terrible job in promoting this. But as of January 1st of this year, farmer customers can purchase the special tools, repair manuals, and diagnostic equipment that's being made available from the major manufacturers. These items are also available to third party or independent repair shops. And getting this information out, we feel is um, a great compromise to offset the demand for legislation to fix a problem that doesn't exist. But we understand the need that customers have on downtime and making these items available will help on that. But we also see improved technology coming as well in, in terms of rural broadband. And that will allow us to do more remote diagnostics once we have better rural broadband. And, and we know that this will certainly help with downtime into the future. So with that, that brings us to modifying or chipping equipment. And this is rather rampant uh, across Western Canada. And as an association, our message to you, to the producers, is that we feel it's just not worth the risk. Modifying your equipment away from the OEM's original specification puts at risk your warranty, your insurance coverage. You lose some rights under provincial ag implement legislation. It leads to accelerated engine wear and decreasing value in your equipment. In addition to that, the installation of a DEF delete kit is in violation of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and a producer can face fines in the thousands, and in, in the U.S., the fines have been even as high as in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, one fine we saw was $300,000 for the removal of a DEF delete kit on one unit. We're also seeing some provinces start to get a little serious on this concern. Uh, it's our understanding that in Ontario, if the emissions device is removed, the unit cannot be resold in the province. So we believe it's only a matter of time like provisions like this are in place in other provinces across the country. Our association has launched a public relations campaign on the issue. And in the end, we believe that sooner or later, if equipment is chipped or tuned, a farmer pays. We believe that modifying your equipment is just not worth the risk. So if you consider modifying your equipment, we encourage you to ask yourself these three questions. And I wish to emphasize the Western Equipment Dealers Association and our farm equipment dealer members across Canada respect your ability to use your equipment as you see fit. But we can't condone illegal modification and chipping only decreases the value of your farm equipment long term. So finally, just before I turn it back to Richie Brothers, um, these are the top concerns that dealers are saying that our producers are sharing with them. Pricing of new technologies and new equipment in general, like, like Craig had referenced, it's set by the manufacturers. The currency rate has some impact on that. And honestly, we, we wish we had more control on the pricing than, than we really do. But we do hear that from customers on a regular basis. Commodities, input costs, carbon taxes or energy fuel costs and trade issues round out the top five concerns that we are hearing from producers at this time. And with that, and on behalf of our Canadian equipment dealer members across the country, we wish you a very successful 2021. Jordan. Yep, you bet. Uh, Kevin, Thanks, any, any, any <clears throat> other things you guys are hearing about what's keeping farmers up at night? Well, I think, you know, the, the list that you see there right now, that's that's just a small um, aspect of it. I think when you look at from an agricultural producer standpoint, they, they risk a lot. And uh, a lot of those a lot of those things that affect their operation are out of their control. So 
Um, it's one of those very challenging occupations where you have to play within uh, parameters that a lot of other people set. And of course, when you're talking about weather, it's, you know, it's Mother Nature's in charge of that, right? So uh, right now in Western Canada, that, that is kind of the hot topic for uh, typically Southern Alberta, Southern Saskatchewan and Southern Manitoba. Uh, then you get in other parts of, of the, you know, the north part of Western Canada, and they, they actually have quite a bit of moisture as opposed to the south, which is dry. So um, it's one of those challenging things that it's it's typically never going to be right. Um, and when it is, of course, you know, a lot of our producers are, are thankful for it, but um, it does put a lot of risk. And of course, it, it, it keeps our producers, which I think are some of the best in the world, um, on their toes to, to try and make the right decisions on what to plant, when to plant, uh, when to take it off. Um, you know, there's lots of things that that uh, that factors in and they try and mitigate those risks the best they can. Um, from an, an auction standpoint with succession planning, obviously a lot of the farm auctions, uh, you know, the 71 that we just did in, uh, in March and April, the majority of those are retirement auction sales. So uh, a lot of cases we're having the discussions with uh, the customers um, well ahead of, you know, actually making the decision to sell, but it's they want to get some information and understand the process. Uh, and a lot of times there isn't necessarily a succession plan. There's there's a retirement plan, but not a, a succession to take over the farm. Uh, and it might be a, a lack of of family or friends or or people that have shown interest to take over the farm. Uh, it might just be complications due to how to you know capture value out of those assets before passing it on to somebody else. And I know um, it's it's one of the most talked about topics right now in in any agricultural circle that you that you um, discuss on is is how we transition that farm from one generation to the other without a large debt load. Obviously, the the value of land, the value of equipment, as we just discussed throughout the the, the last hour, is ever increasing. Uh, and how does that next generation come in and start farming without millions and millions of debt to try and dig out of before they, they can actually start making money, right? So uh, there's a lot of specialists that are out there that really, really help with that, which is important because, you know, early on in the auction days and you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't a lot of people that had a lot of help and it wasn't something that was discussed uh, overly uh, open. So it's great to see that people are, are taking the initiative to, to help the producers. And of course, the producers are taking the initiative themselves uh, to reach out and gather all the evidence they can and make sure that they're making the, the smart moves prior to that transition. No, that's, um, um, you know, th that is, uh, you know, fascinating from the standpoint of, you know, you really think about, you know, how much this weighs into, you know, the, the, the whole kind of transition and just, you know, kind of the, the culture of Western Canada and, and, and all of that. I think, you know, as, as we go, you know, through this process as as a company and as an organization, you know, in you know many many years, you know, we've been we've been seen as as just an auctioneer. But you know, as we, you know, one of the things we've been trying to do, you know, in addition to these webinars, in addition to to some of the things we've been doing with online bidding and online auctions and this hybrid model we've developed, is you know, really trying to do a better job of providing information. And, and we know as, you know, as a, as a company that, that sells billions and billions of dollars worth of equipment, you know, you know, every year, there's a lot of price information locked up in those transactions. And so we've been trying to make, you know, tools, you know, available to, you know, people out there who are trying to make those decisions, right? Trying to make those those life altering decisions, if you will, in terms of, you know, hey, what is my equipment worth? What is my land worth? You know, when is a good time to sell? And, you know, we've been investing a lot of that, a lot in that as a company uh, over the last couple of years to kind of take all that information and unleash it so that, you know, everyone can use that. Um, so I want to thank, uh, we don't have any questions, uh, any additional questions flowing in. Uh, I want to thank the folks who attended, and I want to thank the, the the panelists. And this is this is amazing information. Uh, we have recorded this. We will be distributing this. So if you you know if you attended today and you get this and you think this is great information, which I'm sure you do, pass it on. Uh, it's uh, you know I you know I learned a ton today. And I hope everybody did. And, and I just want to once again, thank everybody for participating, especially to our guests today, Craig and John, you know, really ap appreciated the external insight uh, that we received. So uh, with that, uh, I want to, you know, hit the gavel and uh, 
adjourn for the day and and we will continue to do this. We will continue to provide information in different ways. Look for more of these series, more of these guests. And and once again, thank you everybody who who participated today and have a good one.